You're now listening to the Laravel Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Laravel Podcast Season 6. I'm one of your hosts, Matt Stauffer, and Taylor, you want to say hi? Hey, everybody. That's Taylor Otwell, the man, the mystery, the legend, the founder of Laravel. <laughs> and today we got a, a lot of topics, but the big focus of today is going to be about testing. But before we get there, there is a new release of, or two. I know that Pale came out with an official release, but we already talked about Pale last time. But there's also a new Breeze stack. We talked about one last time, but could you share kind of what's going on with Folio and the Folio functional and everything like that in the Breeze stacks if people aren't familiar with Folio? Oh, you mean Volt. <laughs> Sorry, Volt. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, Volt. Yes, Folio is cool, but we mean Volt. Um, yes, we mean Volt. So, yeah, we released a new um, Breeze stack, probably our last stack for a while for Breeze. Um, it is Livewire stack, but using the Volt functional syntax for your components. So um, what that means is your component logic for your live wire components is right there in the template. And not only is it right there in the template, it has this functional style that is like, you know, if you want to define a method, you just define a closure and give the variable a name. And then you can assign that to like a wire click handler. Um, if you want to define some state, like some state variables, you just call the state function and tell it the name of the variable. Um, it's kind of similar to like the view composition API versus the view options API is kind of, kind of what it feels like the difference between those two things but anyway we released a new stack uh, for breeze that ships with that out of the box so that is actually a really easy way to sort of try it out and when you put that announcement out you mentioned that there's you can now use the volt not fully you can use the volt function or the volt class based so at some point we switched Mm -hmm. from the traditional live wire to the volt class based as the primary one in Mm -hmm. breeze right we've actually never had a true live wire um, stack and breeze that was like right. separate. Right, right, right. That's only Jetstream. Yes. Yeah. See, I yeah. was and Jetstream. See, I just get the words of all yeah. the ones mixed up. <laughs> There's so many packages now. Uh-huh. Uh, Jetstream is still the same, but uh, yeah, yeah, and breeze. We we only have Volt Livewire options in yep. breeze. Okay. Um. So because I mixed up Folio and Volt, let's just real quick talk about. So Volt, you already explained what it is. It's the yeah. the new kind of syntax, the class, you know, all in one sort of like the view components version of Livewire. Can you talk mm-hmm. real quick about Folio since we haven't actually covered it extensively? Yeah, Folio, Folio is super simple. It's just a page-based routing package for Laravel. So you can drop a blade template in a pages directory and just go straight to it in your browser using like some routing conventions. So if the template is like, about dash us dot blade dot php you can go to my application.com slash about dash us and it renders the template um, and you can do all sorts of like wild cards and parameters um, very similar to like next js page based routing in laravel yeah. and one of the cool things about working with folio is because of volt you can also do significantly more functionality in those individual pages than you would have had we had folio without volt which is why kind of they're intertwined in my head and you kind of released around the same time and everything like volt makes folio so much more powerful yeah exactly i think i think volt makes folio legit useful versus just like an interesting toy (laughs) yes totally all right so let's talk about tests we got a ton of questions about tests but i also mentioned you earlier that i've been um reading tons of code uh tight knit a hiring round in the last couple weeks so i've just read just so much code from folks and they are all building the same application but we can really see like how they do it differently in this take home and one of the things that i've noticed is that people write tests very differently so when i was looking at like the queue of questions we had from people about tests i was like oh this is really relevant to what i've been thinking at the biggest question here has just been what are the best practices for writing tests and obviously that's a broad thing and anytime someone says best practices it goes like a little bit of like a yellow flag going like well best practices in what context or whatever. But like one of the things I wanted to just see is we can talk through at least what helps us make the delineation in a given application between one or the other. So it's not like one way is right and one way is wrong, but more like it's a, it depends kind of thing, right? So I kind of wanted to start at the highest level. Um, Even though PEST, which is a testing framework created by a Laravel core member, um, and it's now being shipped and everything like that, it's been around for a while you can choose pest when you're starting a new laravel app a lot of laravel projects you know use pest testing i think a lot of people either don't know about pest or what they know about pest is purely just that it's that different syntax like the it whatever you know t- type of syntax could you talk a little bit about test and, and for anybody curious nuno as the, the creator of pest has 
uh, Laro podcast episode from last season where he goes into much greater depth. So if you really want to get all the details of it, go there. But Taylor, could you give us like a real quick rundown of like what Pest offers that kind of makes it motivating for you to offer it as a um, as a potential syntax for folks, or not even syntax, but a t- t- potential test runner for Laro Lar- 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 apps? Um, yeah, I mean, like you said, Pest sort of removes a lot of the noise from traditional PHP unit testing um you know suites um so you can do all of the normal things you can do in php unit but you can also do a bunch of other things um and just the overall um syntax style i mean it feels similar to vault right where like it removes a lot of the sort of code noise and boils your test down to just simple functions that are invoked um it has a bunch of other like cool stuff like i think the way or i don't know i don't know if it's really like new stuff separate from php unit but it's just more ergonomic i would say like Mm. the way you use data providers in php unit is like i believe putting like a comment annotation you know like on your data provider method and blah 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 whereas in pest it you might just like chain on like a with method or I, I don't remember what the method is and give it like an array of data and that's your data yeah. provider. Um, so a lot of just like really um, sort of more developer experience focused um, niceties are in yeah. tests. I think it also includes some stuff that's kind of just not in PHP unit. Like there's the architecture testing plugin where you can make sure that like all of the classes in a certain directory, maybe have don't a certain extend dependent. anything or have uh, a certain yeah, style. Yeah. Have a certain yeah. suffix or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I find that kind of nice. I actually um, don't have a ton of experience using Pest in production projects. It's not actually a, um, it's not really like a first party tool that we maintain here at Laravel. It's just a very popular package that's maintained by Nuno, who now happens to work at Laravel. Yes, exactly. Um, and we have it as an option in our um, starter kits because it has become sort of so popular in the Laravel ecosystem. I mean, very similar to like Livewire or Inertia yeah. where a package becomes so popular, it feels, you know, quasi first party at a certain point, yeah. um, especially when the person they're maintaining it works at Laravel. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, a lot of people seem to like it. And um, I think for the developer experience of the whole thing. Yeah. And uh, for those who don't know, so Pest both has a different syntax, which is similar to RSpec, right? So it's like the whole it, and then you know you write a nice string right. rather than having to give your your snake cased f- method name. And then inside a closure, you do your test there, and that's where you're saying there's all these niceties where you're chaining things on, and there's a lot less of the cruft of a class or whatever. But for those mm-hmm. who are maybe unsure about it, you can use Pest to run PHP unit style tests, and you still get the benefit of um, a whole bunch of additional tooling that Pest comes with that a lot of people who add to all of their PHP unit test apps anyway, like parallel testing and coverage and this right. uh, this custom architecture testing tool and you're talking about and stuff like that. There's a lot of tools mm-hmm. that Pest brings in even if you choose to use the PHP unit syntax. And I did not know that. It's when I was talking to Nuno originally. I thought Pest meant the RSpec syntax and that's it. And so when I learned that it's like, it's yeah. building all these features on top of PHP unit and also adds an optional syntax, I was like, oh, okay. Like then it makes a lot more sense just to work with it. So mm-hmm mm-hmm yeah okay snapshot testing things like yeah that. yeah yeah um so let's dig into some specifics of writing tests whether it's in pester and php unit so the first question that i see come up and it came up a lot in a lot of my interviews over the last couple of weeks is unit versus feature test a lot of people have these very strict definitions of what a unit test is and what a feature test is and if it's a unit test it's not allowed to touch the database and stuff like that and i know historically mm-hmm. people have said a unit test is a test that does test only one thing but what that one thing is allowed to be can be a little bit of like a different definition like is that one thing involved doing the database or not you know like so in your mind do you have like a really strong delineation of feature versus unit test is it something you think about a lot i feel like i write like it's rare that i write something that i put in the unit test directory in a laravel app i just feel like that's really rare for me um it would, it's like you, it would usually be some sort of specific, like, let's imagine you had a method that performs some array manipulation to put an array in a certain structure or like some mathematical computation, like a formula, yeah. you know, like maybe you're calculating like bonus pay for a certain period for an employee. And that's the specific math calculation that feels like something that can be unit tested, you know, like that formula. And it's probably not hitting the database, but I just feel like it's so rare and the applications I build, at least where I'm, where I have something like that, even to test. Yeah. Um, most of my tests are feature tests. Most of them hit the database in some way. Most of them even hit routes in some way. Um, yeah. Those are most of the tests I write because I just feel like 
that's the types of applications I'm building. And they're also the tests that just give me the most confidence in the overall stability of the application. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes Do you find yourself build... writing mini unit tests. Yeah. Sometimes we've built some projects recently where we don't even know what the application is going to look like yet, but we are working with mm. a, um, like a researcher or something or an analyst who's like, I have this kind of like magic formula that I built in Excel. And we need to represent that magic formula and then build an interface in front of it. And so one of the things we do often is build a black box like PHP class that represents the formula because it's usually not a formula. It's usually 30 different formulas with 50 different inputs that output one or more pieces of data. And often you can put in, in data in or out without touching a user interface, a route, or anything like that. That's my most common mm. use case for unit tests because it is actually a unit, right? This black box class or set of classes takes inputs, spits out outputs. Then later, we'll plug it into places, and then we don't have to worry quite as much that our feature tests are testing the math or the code or whatever. Or the math of it, it's more just testing the traditional app things, like if you get an input, it's validated or not or whatever. Outside right. of those things with a very specific, nuanced you know, like kind of core identity or math or calculations or whatever, it's pretty infrequent for me. And one of the things you mentioned, like a pay structure, like I have a, a calculator that I run that handles um, profit sharing for Titan. So it calculates how much profit share everybody gets every quarter. And it is doing lots of very calculated compilation cal calculations that I need to make sure it gets right. But a lot of it's based on the database. And so, I, I, you know, that's where I was kind of like, I guess you can call it a unit test because it's saying, in this circumstance, you know, what does this calculation run? But I put it in my futures test directory because it requires, here's 20 people, each of whom has the last six salaries that have been a different very and plug in the calculations and make sure that it correctly gets the latest salary for each person, even if they're right in the edge of a new salary. Like, so it's even those complicated calculations I'm doing with that one are still so connected to the database that it's very much feature test. So the answer is not yeah. very often, but every once in a while when we've got one of those little kind of black box calculators. Yeah, I actually just pulled up Laravel Vapor here on my end just to see what we had in our unit test directory. And one of the tests we have is it looks like a custom validation rule for valid repository name. So it's basically okay. a string validation check and we feed a bunch of strings into it um, and yeah. it spits back true or false. So that's like very unit testy to me. Yeah, uh, It's not hitting any database or anything like that. And it's probably helpful to clarify for people, like what is actually the difference between the feature and the unit test directory in Laravel from a tech perspective. And the mm -hmm. main difference yeah. is tests in the feature directory actually boot up the framework and call all of your service providers. They bootstrap the whole you know, Laravel app. Um, whereas tests in the unit directory just extend the PHP unit test class and they don't do any framework booting. You can still call, you know, instantiate any of your classes because composer autoloader is registered, yeah. but none of your service providers have run. You can't, you know, call into the app. So what does that mean? Basically it means that your unit tests boot up a little faster in terms of your test suite because we don't have to bootstrap the whole Laravel app. Now, does it actually make a difference in your application probably depends on, you know, how many unit tests you have. And if you just have a few, it's, you know, it's, it's negligible and not really going to make a difference, but that is the, the tech difference between putting something in a feature directory versus the unit directory in, in a Laravel context. Yeah, that's very helpful. And so like the general rule here seems to be like, if you are relying on your Laravel application to be booted, then it should be a feature mm -hmm. test. And if you're not, then it shouldn't yeah. be. And that's great because that's more than just database, right? That's also, if it, if it relies on any aspects of your service providers having been set up or anything like that, like you can then say, okay, well then it's gotta be in the feature test. So obviously yeah. that's a Laravel specific thing, but it's a Laravel podcast, so we can talk about it that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Um, um, all right. So the, I just okay. think one one sort of epiphany. I don't know. This is kind of moving deeper into the testing That's thing, fine. but um, I think it was a big epiphany for me in my testing career, so to speak. Where I kind of had this phase of testing where I was like mocking everything. It felt yeah. like and injecting everything into my controllers, and all of those things were mocked. And it started to feel like my tests were sort of. Uh, I think I've tweeted before. It felt like my tests were becoming spell checkers to make sure that the right methods right. on certain mocks were called, like expect this yeah. method to be called and return this, expect this method didn't return that. Yeah. And it's like, what? I'm just sort of rewriting the method itself in my yeah. test. I'm not actually mm -hmm. testing any behavior. Yeah. Um, and in, early in my career, it felt like a lot of my tests looked like that because I think... Um, it depends who your influences are, but a lot of sort of testing gurus had this very mock heavy approach. It felt like at the time. Yeah. And that's sort of what I learned. But as it moved further into my career, um, 
I sort of went the opposite direction where I just very rarely mock anything. Like um, I hit the database in every test. Like a, a, a very typical test for me will be hit X controller endpoint or some URL. Expect that some result is returned from the controller and make sure the database looks a certain way by yeah. sort of, you know, either querying the database or making sure the right data is in place. That's yeah. very typical. Like 90% of my tests look like that. Yeah. Um, and that just gives me so much more confidence than the old sort of like over mocked, yeah. over complicated, noisy test that really just is so brittle because every time the impl implementation yes. of the method changes, you're updating your test, which is a huge code smell for me that your tests are way too brittle if every if you feel like every time you update your, your controller in some minor way you also have to update your test that's that's defeating the whole point of tests you know which is to yeah. let us refactor with yes. confidence without having to change our test every time yeah and I, um, as you were saying that i was just thinking like if you refactor the implementation of a particular feature without changing the input or the outputs your tests shouldn't have to change and if they do yes, that's yeah. a sign that you're too tightly coupled you're to too coupled to the testing, implementation, implementation. Yeah. absolutely which is interesting because when you say tight coupling normally people are using it critically of doing something like feature tests oh your tests are too coupled to the to framework but the problem <laughs> is like you it you, using these more broad feature tests, you're testing the input, you're testing the output or whatever, or you're giving input testing the output, allows you to not be coupled to a particular implementation, which allows you to write code and rewrite code and rewrite code without constantly rewriting your tests. Um, yeah. It, I mean, the whole point of tests is to, of course, make sure our, our code is correct and does what we expect, but also to be able to refactor with confidence. And you just yeah. can't do that if you have to change the test yeah. every time you refactor. Yeah, and it's super interesting because when I did the Valet 3 to Valet 4 rewrite, I was really spending a time, a lot of time with the tests. And the Valet tests have to be very mock-heavy because they're testing what happens when your system is in a certain state. And there's no way, mm -hmm. you you know, you can't like do like a yeah. fake the <laughs> yeah. system or fake the database or fake, or fake the file system or whatever without doing mocks. And it had just made me realize how much of a smell heavily mocking is because that ended up with the valet tests being very tightly tied to implementation and that was just a necessary evil because of valet. But it just kind of helped me realize how far we've come from when that's what all of our web application tests look like for sure. Um, so one of the things you mentioned as we're going there was you'd like to test, you know, you give a particular input to a route, uh, you test that the response is the same, the way you want, and then you, you test the database afterwards. How often mm -hmm. are you going to test the database using a cert, you know, database has versus checking the output on the page that you know reflects the, the status of the database? Um, I mainly check, I actually usually run database queries to make sure, and I honestly rarely use like um, that assert database has stuff, actually. Okay. I just like run a database query, expect that a count is a certain number okay. or that the right data is in place. Um, or I'll just like, if I already have a model, I'll just call like refresh on the model mm -hmm. and make sure the data looks correct. Um, I think because a lot of our front ends are inertia based or whatever i'm not usually inspecting like the actual html content so much yeah. as i'm expecting the data that's being sent back to the front end yeah um as far as like the front end um we have like a suite of dust tests on nova itself um to make sure our front end works um the way we expect but anyway yeah i mean the, the database check is sort of the typical flow for me yeah I, I like that for two reasons. One is that I think if you test the HTML, then now you're tied in this place where what if that HTML changes? Now this test that doesn't have anything to do with that HTML has to change, right? Whereas if you just inspect the database, you're good. And then you could have a test later that says, you know, depending on the status of the database, check to make sure that the HTML is the way you want. That test can be about your output if you want, and it might be in Dusk mm -hmm. instead. Um, but the other thing is, I hadn't thought about this before, but you choosing to use a database query instead of using the the assertions that are directly tied to the database means it's clearer because it's literally the SQL, the eloquent code we all deal with in a database and that should exist in that database already. Um, but also it's going to be more connected to what the actual practical functional queries are going to be elsewhere. So if you've got scopes or anything like that, like those scopes will mm -hmm. be reflected in that query in a way they wouldn't be in the assert database has. And so you're seeing more of like a practical, like what actually would come to an average eloquent query as a result of this database being the state it's in right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now one area that I do, um, I guess you could call it mocking in a way um, is like bus fake, Q fake, mail mm -hmm. fake, all the fakes in Laravel. I do use those um, yeah. pretty heavily. Um, that 
feels like less brittle to me um, because and the reason why I use those is, for example, if I'm hitting a controller that queues a job, I'll call queue fake to turn off, basically turn off the queue, but I can still make assertions that the, the job was actually dispatched. It's just yeah. not actually going to execute yep. because I usually write a separate test for the queue job itself, you know, where I'll actually create the job, call the handle method, yes. make sure it does what it is supposed to do, query the database again, very similar to my other test. Uh, but I don't usually, you know, let that actually execute during the controller endpoint thing. I'll just make sure that the controller dispatched the jobs I expect it to dispatch yep. and sort of write that test in a different test class. Yeah. And that's, to me, that's an output, right? Like if you say input and output, like, well, the input is, let's say, a post to a controller, a route or something like that. The output could be the database is modified. The output could be that there's a certain HTTP response sent back to the browser. The output could be a notification was sent or a job was queued or whatever. And what you want to do in that controller yeah. test or that route test is make sure that output happened. But again, like you're saying here, like that doesn't mean you also then want to go test that output. Like you're, And one of the things yeah. I often see in people's tests is that they accidentally end up testing Laravel's code because they're like, test to make sure that this collection mapping works the way I want it to. And I'm like, Laravel's got tests for that already. And similarly, yeah. like if you feel like when you dispatch the route, you have to test the whole way through to every single thing that queued job is going to do or every single thing the notification is going to do, you're now expanding the scope of what you're testing, which is mm. not really necessarily like you're getting outside of the scope of what you should be testing. The route should test that the things happen. And then by using bus fake, by using queue fake, by using you know notification fakes or whatever, you're giving yourself the ability to say, test that it was dispatched. And then somewhere else say, when it's dispatched, test to make sure that it does this. And now they're, they're handled separately. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing we were, I can't remember, I don't think we were recording yet when we mentioned this, but testing sort of, that's, we're talking about testing the happy path right now, but yeah. You also have to test like validation failures, error mm -hmm. states, and there sort of seems like no end to the amount of tests you can write for all yes. of the invalid scenarios that can possibly happen and knowing when to stop doing that, I think is interesting. Um, and I think there's tools for this, right? I, I think it's called like, is it mutation testing or mm -hmm. like something like that where it feeds like all the sorts of random data into your test to see if it fails. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, I'm curious what you do there. I mean, the things I primarily test when we're trying to test failure states is security related things like yeah. make sure that a user that doesn't own this blog post can't update this blog post, yes. you know, that kind of thing. Make sure they can't delete this blog post. Like those are the first, you know, failure tests we write, especially on something like Forge or Vapor, um, where we need to be very security conscious. Yeah. Um, and then I'll test like on my end, I'll test like kind of basic validation errors and make sure I get the validation exceptions that I expect on the right attributes. But of course, there's all sorts of other scenarios I'm sure I could test, um, but I don't find myself writing them. I'm curious if you do anything there, kind of where, how far do you go um, down that yeah. path? It's, it's, it's a fantastic question because I don't know. I feel like there's a part of me that thinks I should test every single thing to make sure it's validated. And sometimes I've done that, especially if it's like in a, it's very, very important for this client for every single piece of data to be tested the way we want. And so we'll use usually data providers to make sure that each one is tested individually and each one you know, gives the error you want. Some of the cleanest code I've seen lately tests one valid one to make sure it works and one completely invalid one and just tests to make sure it gets all the errors. And I'm like, mm. I don't mind that as like yeah. a stopgap one. Like you test one that has all the data that you know is required and make sure it actually goes through. And you test one that's that's literally an empty array. You're posting an empty array and you test to make sure that you get every single validation error that you expect. And then hopefully mm. you're good. And one of the things that does require you to do is not do any validation that's like a one-off validation that if, if this one's invalid, you don't even get to the others. And that's one of the things I see people do often is that they get to a very complicated validation rule. Instead of writing a validation rule and putting it in the validation array, they'll do like a manual check before they hit the validator. And one of the downsides of that is if that one fails, you only get that error, you don't get the other errors. So that's one of the many reasons why I think it's often work worth the work of taking an extra 30 minutes to an hour of writing a custom validation rule for that weird edge case versus just doing a manual database check before we're in. Um, yeah. But I, I completely agree with you though. No matter what I'm doing, I need to make sure, and I always tell people this, in testing, make sure that things that are gonna get you fired or the things that are gonna get your company <laughs> in the front page in the New York, New York Times, if, yeah. if you, when I say that, you know what that means for your company, right? Test those things. And so if it is accidentally allowing somebody to, you know, charge somebody money they shouldn't or log into somebody else's security thing or whatever, test those no matter what. And then everything else kind of flows down from there. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense.
Um, do you do you use data providers at all? It's something that like I feel like I should use more than I do. And and you you mentioning it's easier in Pest. I'm like ah maybe I should use Pest more just so I could use yeah. data providers more. The the ergonomics of using data providers are definitely much better in Pest than in um, traditional PHP unit. Um, I wouldn't say I use them a lot. Um, we use them more when testing Laravel itself more than I seem to use yeah. them in real applications. I think. Um, I, I don't know why. I mean, like I said, like in this Vapor project, we had a unit test that does use a data provider, but it's definitely over 95% of our tests, I'm sure, do not use a data provider. Yeah, and I'm, I'm very similar in that if I'm dealing with open source code where I can imagine just all sorts of different user inputs, all sorts of different uses, I'll usually yes. have an array of some sort that says, here's all the, the millions of different ways that could... And, and then later when I get like a failing test or, or getting a... um. I get a issue or something like that. And I'm like, oh, you didn't cover this one string or that one string. First thing I'm gonna do is gonna add it to that array. And then I'm gonna fix the code until that, until that thing is green. And now we know there's one more thing on the stack of things that we're covering in this code. Very, very common. Yeah. In yeah. my Data code providers for... feel very tied to validation to me. Yeah, validation yeah. scenarios where you need mm -hmm. a lot of different data. Mm -hmm. Or like you said, no, no, even the one you said was a check. It's a validating to make sure that this thing right. is a valid repo. So yeah. I think that's very common for me. I don't do data providers in um, uh, checks against routes. Uh, against routes, I've seen people do that before, where they're like, mm -hmm. "I'm going to give every single field, like we're mentioning before, every single field is going to have a failing state, with all the rest of them have a passing state. I'm going to run through all of it, and I think that's overkill. Um, and I've mm -hmm. seen that quite a bit in the last week, where um, I think out of abundance of caution, people will just write every single possible failure state they can possibly imagine as an individual test, and each of those tests is 10, 15 lines long. And although yeah. I understand where it comes from, I'm just like it's too much. It's one of these where I don't have a, a hard and fast rule, but I just you know it when you see it. And I'm like, sometimes there's just too many tests against the same route. Yeah, I mean it's kind of an interesting thing, right? Because um, there's some people that are like you know very dogmatic about 100% test coverage over your entire code base, yeah. um, whereas other people I think um, emphasize more like test the things that. Um, you need to test the most to gain the most confidence out of your application, like test the most sensitive parts of your application the most, Yeah, obviously. And then the more peripheral parts that are sort of um, um, not as important, maybe um, you don't have to spend, you know, you don't need thousands and thousands of lines of tests over those things. You know, if they're not very central to the application necessarily. Yeah. I think that that's a great point. Code coverage is a, um, it's sometimes obsessed over in ways that aren't healthy. You know, some companies say every single pull request must increase our code coverage, or we are reaching for 100% code coverage. And I think that every single PR must increase our code coverage is okay if you have no code coverage and you're trying to get up to 60 or 70 or something like that, right? So I, I think that like 50% hmm. code coverage is good. 60 is better. 70 is better. I feel like when you're getting up at those higher numbers, you really have to obsess over things that, that it's one of those things where you're satisfying the machine versus the, the human who's actually going to work with those tests in the future. And while I do think that yeah. tests are good for covering our butts, part of what tests should also do is inform and protect and, and you know help future programmers working on the project, right? Test is documentation. And when you're looking for 100% code coverage, you're not doing that. You are making it very hard to reason with. Yeah, because... It's like, what does 100% even mean? It almost feels like a meaningless number. It means that, I guess, that all of the code in the project was executed at some point mm -hmm. during your test suite, but you don't know if it was the right test or if it tested the right thing. Um, or And it doesn't mean that all of the other invalid scenarios were also tested. You know, it's, yep. it's sort of like, it's not a helpful number, in my yes. opinion, because it doesn't really mean much. It doesn't tell you if the tests were actually good or if they were helpful or if they even checked the right thing at all yeah. um, from a business perspective and from a security perspective or whatever. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think it's like, I don't think it's a helpful thing because I don't think it means much. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And I would say that like, there's something to be said about re relying on existing metrics for testing because we don't all know all the things that can go wrong, right? So there's something to be said, like right. at least looking to external things. And one of the things I remember in the first app I ever built, thankfully it wasn't public. This is in the days of Code Igniter where we didn't have the type of protections we have in Laravel. I had a user profile update form 
and the user ID that you were updating was just a hin hidden input. So someone could just go in view mm. source in their <laughs> browser, change that input to be two, hit post, and then unchange it. And thankfully, I talked to an older programmer, and he's like, yeah, I just changed your password. You know, let's work on this. But the good news yeah. is things like that are usually, we're protected from them because of the conventions that are built in a Laravel, right? Like a lot of the dumb things that we wouldn't know to test for because we're so junior um, are really protected mm -hmm. from unless... This is so funny, unless you're fighting the framework. The more you fight the framework in <laughs> any way, shape, or form, the more you have to know everything. But the more you work with the framework's right. conventions, the more you can just say, what do I need to know from a business perspective that my business cares about? And you can trust that a lot of the potential security concerns aren't going to be there as long as you're working with eloquent and validation and you know all that kind of stuff. So um, mm -hmm. once again, a pitch for people to not fight the tools, don't fight the framework, um, but also an idea that yeah. like, to me, as someone who says, like, the po point of software is value to people or businesses, you know, in our businesses, then the validation should be validating that, like, the bad thing doesn't happen to the business and the good thing does happen. The, 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 the user doesn't have a bad experience and they do have a good experience. And those are really the things that we're checking for. And it should be clear, mm -hmm. right? Like, any time, one of the reasons that people started rant here a little bit, but like when people criticize Tailwind from a CSS perspective, they say, oh, you know, there's so many classes. But the thing is, I have built many CSS based structures. I have talked about OO CSS and all these CSS based structures pre Tailwind. And what I found, and one of the reasons that I came around to Tailwind, um, was that when I came back to a code base two years later, no matter how well I'd architected that code base originally, not only was I not fully able to follow the CSS, but other people who came along had at some point said, I don't know where the heck this is supposed to go. I'm just going to put it in a like extra that CSS file. When people yeah. don't understand the existing systems, they don't work with them. They don't say, oh, I'm going to go learn this whole system and figure out where it should go. They just put crap in places you don't expect it to be or where it shouldn't be. So when people That's... can't reason with it, sorry, go ahead. I was going to, I mean, I, we're getting off topic, but th this, this okay. is the thing I find most ironic about the tailwind sort of criticism on the Twitter sphere, or the X sphere or whatever it's called these days is it's that you, you see people say like, will it scale? Is it maintainable? And the, the ironic thing about it is that's precisely why it's so good is because yes. it's, it, it does scale and it is yes, maintainable, it's maintainable. Yep. unlike all these other custom CSS solutions that we've concocted. Yep. And to me, it's the same thing here with these tests, right? Like if I have a 100% coverage test suite that has thousands of tests because they had to catch every single thing, I'll have no idea where to look when I add something, edit something. Now, granted, tests give you a little bit more than CSS does because you can see when the test fails. But still, if I don't have the ability to understand the code base of, of tests, then those tests now become just sort of like a hard and fast fixed thing that I can't change, I can't modify. If I write code that breaks it, I'm just going to just unwrite that code. You know what I mean? Like what I want is tests yeah. that I can understand all of them. I can read through them. Like literally when I do code review, the test directory is the first place I go because in a well-written code base, the test directory is going to tell me what the thing does, what the thing is not supposed to do, you know? So yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. So I had one last topic for us and then we're at our 30 minute mark. Um, the last topic was traits versus inheritance. And there's other ways of kind of talking about talking about this topic, but one of the things that's come mm -hmm. up often in PHP, but then also in CSS and everything like that is people talk, and when we're talking about final classes, which has come up a lot lately because there's some drama about that lately, it's people who are mm -hmm. very, very anti-inheritance and very pro, you know, mix-in or trait or whatever you want to call it. And the thing that mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about is the fact that in Laravel, we use both a lot. There's a lot of traits and there's a lot of inheritance. And I also know that in the past, you've talked about the fact that you think that this is a little bit of a different conversation in open source code versus individual application code. Yes. 100%, Can you tell me yeah. a little bit about your thoughts about traits versus inheritance? Um, yeah. So I think people get the impression that like, oh, we use inheritance all over the place in Laravel, which is definitely not the case. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I'll start in application code. Um, I actually very rarely find myself using inheritance when writing application code in projects. I was, yeah. It's pretty unusual, I would say, that I'm ever extending a class that's also in my application. Um, it just doesn't seem to come up much. I don't know why. Um, yeah. Occasionally use traits. I mean, even that is... I mean, it's not super common, I would say, that I'm that I'm using traits that aren't like built into Laravel. I'm talking about like my own traits that I write that I'm using in other classes. Yeah. Um, I think it definitely happens some, but it's not something I'm just reaching for all the time. Whereas 
an open source code, I think inheritance is useful in certain scenarios. Um, so the things that come to mind are like very driver based things like the cache drivers, the yeah. queue drivers, the database drivers, um, or you have a lot of shared functionality across this like driver system where you have like a Redis driver, a memcache driver, and they do very similar things. Yeah. Um, and you just want to share some code between them. I think with the advent of traits, um, a, some of that extension became unnecessary, but it was already sort of written um, at yeah. that point because yeah. it was already built into Laravel. Um, so would I use inheritance in those situations now if I was writing Laravel from scratch? Maybe it wouldn't be necessary. Yeah. I could just use a couple traits to share some helpful methods with those classes. Um, but again, I, I sort of agree that using inheritance all the time in your application code is sort of weird, or at least it doesn't seem to come up a lot for me. Um, we definitely use interfaces sometimes. Um, like for example, in Laravel Forge, um, you can connect your account to like GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, and those source control providers, we have an interface called like source control provider, and it has methods like git commit hash, git repository. Yeah. Um, I don't think those extend anything. They're just a, an interface that we use. Um, I don't know about you. Do you, do you find yourself using inheritance? And I, I mean, outside of like extending eloquent model. Yeah. Um, do you find yourself using inheritance and application code a lot? No, and I was actually going to mention the same thing you did about interfaces. I found that a lot of times that we would be tempted to reach for um, for inheritance, it turns out an interface does the job. When I would be most likely to do it is, let's say a source control provider is technically like an interface because you want to be able to take a generic source control provider throughout your app and every single one of these is going to have these three methods. So you can build an interface for them. But what also is the case is 90% of them are going to rely on this one private method that makes it really easy to do something. Or 90% of them have mm -hmm. the exact same way of parsing a Git URL and only 10% of them have a custom way. Then what I'll probably end up doing is do a base abstract class that's source control provider that they all extend. And then each of them, mm -hmm. A, can rely on those private or protected, or protected, not private, those protected methods that those base one provides, um, like little helpers or whatever. And then B, mm -hmm. only the ones with the custom stuff are the ones that have to um, have to customize that method. But for the method that they're all sharing that same method, you know, like, again, let's say it's one that parses the Git URL or something like that. You don't even have to write that method. It can just inherit it from its parent. Um, I know takeout is open source, so it's not quite the same, but takeout has the same concept of like every single feature that you can install with takeout, whether it's MySQL or MS SQL or whatever else has, um, 98% of the time they have the same ways of connecting to Docker and they have the same ways of building the string that you're using yeah. every once in a while. There's those edge cases. So I don't want to have to, you know, and what I could have done was say, well, we've got a trait for building that, you know, they all implement the same interface. They build in a trait. That's the way that 90% of them do it. What I found is mm -hmm. it's easier for my brain to reason about, I've got one main way of doing it. And if you ever see this method in a specific implementation, that's the one that's changing it versus they've all got this trait, you know? Um, but yeah. that said, when it's not that circumstance, I can't tell you when we use inheritance. We do use traits. Uh, we use interfaces a reasonable amount, but I feel like the people who really pitch interfaces a lot like have a bigger Im idea of the value of interfaces than we do because it has to be mm -hmm. a circumstance like that where you're like, we have multiple implementations, probably going to have more in the future of a thing. And it just it's not that common of a use case in application code in my personal experience. Yeah. Yeah. Mine either. It's just not something that seems to come up a lot or, or seems to make sense. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, during the unfinalized drama, it felt like people, um, sort of had the idea that just like it extends everywhere, you know, we're just inheritance all over the place. And I, that's yeah. just definitely not the case. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, um, well, I think that's my last one for today, but I, one of the things I remembered is in the past when it was you and me and a couple other guys podcasting, I always had a fun question at the end, and I want to start bringing that back. And I forgot about that. Yeah. I know, right? And I, <laughs> I had just remembered that I, and this is a little bit of a leading question, but that's okay. I had just seen pictures of you and your family going up to Vermont for like the fall everything. And I wanted to ask you, what is your favorite season? Oh, gosh. Um Honestly, probably summer overall because okay. we can hang out by the pool and have people over yeah. and we're outside. Um, I also like these in-between times like fall and spring where the temperatures are mild and it's super nice to be outside. Um, I think winter is probably the whole family's least favorite season um, Got it. because we're just not getting much outside time. It's cold. It's dreary. Um, but you yeah, Abigail and 
Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, I do. I do like it during the summer. Like, um, yeah. now that we live by the lake and stuff, it is nice to be out there. Um, Abigail hates the winter, like oh, hates really? the winter. And I feel like winters in Arkansas, like are fairly mild, you know, it could yeah. be much worse, um, compared to like, say you're in New York or up North or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, does not like it. Yeah. I am about uh, your family. I'm a fall guy, man. I'm autumn. And I didn't know that my <laughs> yeah, kids had in here nice. that too. But like, so I grew up in Michigan, right? And so every single fall, we've come out of summer. Summer's wonderful. We got every single fall, it starts cooling down. The leaves start changing colors. The oldest cider mill in Michigan is in my hometown. I drove, drive past it every single day. So we'd go get apple cider donuts. We'd go get apple cider. And there'd just be like Halloween events. And you're getting to like, and I'm a big guy, right? I get hot very quickly. So I'm like actually able to put clothing on that I like the way it looks versus just spending all summer being like, what can I put on that keeps me sweating as little as possible? And I just have so much mm-hmm. nostalgia for it. And then I moved to Florida where there is no fall. There is no in-between. It's just hot and a little bit less hot. The, the seasons don't change. Yeah. You don't get a snowy Christmas. And I took a um, – my degree was in – English, but my focus was on creative writing. So I took a poetry class where I literally wrote about fall for an entire semester. And all of my poems were about fall. And thank God the poetry professor was also from, she was like from the, uh, what do they call it? New England. She was from New England somewhere. So she was also nostalgic. So I, I did really well in that class. But I was like, oh my God, mm-hmm. I have such strong feelings about how much I miss it. To the point that like at one point during my time at Titan, I was moaning about it. And Dave Hicking, who lives in Connecticut, bought a box of sa- apple cider donuts and mailed it to me just so I could have them. So um, oh, nice. I didn't know my kids loved it so much. And I was talking to them about fall and it's just starting to hit fall like this week in Georgia. And they were like, yeah, let's go up to North Georgia and go to the apple things. And so sorry to keep telling stories, but last weekend, I think two weekends ago, my fiance is from Omaha and she's been telling me about this p- pumpkin patch for like ages called Vala's pumpkin patch in Omaha. And <laughs> mm-hmm. she's over there celebrating it. Um, and she's been telling me about it for ages. And so for my birthday, we went up, I met a whole bunch of her family, but then me and her immediate family who I know really well, we all went to this and it's not a pumpkin patch Taylor. It is, it is an apple cider uh, mill. It is a pumpkin patch. It is like the little train like rides. I mean, it's theme like theme park. Basically. It is a fall <laughs> theme park. And it's so funny because each of them was like, yeah, when I moved away, I learned that pumpkin patches everywhere are literally just pumpkin <laughs> patches. Like it was a yeah. 15 minute hay bale ride just to get to the pumpkin patch because the pumpkin patch itself was so huge. So we spent an entire wow. day drinking apple cider, riding little go-karts and stuff like that. And I'm like, this is heaven. This is like the best birthday trip I could possibly take. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a nut That's for cool. fall. Turns out my whole family is the same way too. So yeah, that's really cool. Um, before we're done, I just want to ask, what is what is summer in um, in Arkansas like? Like, is it in the eighty? Sorry, Fahrenheit, everybody. But is it in the eighties all summer, or is it cool, just stay oh, cool? Hot, way hotter than that. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's like over a, over a hundred all summer. Is Arkansas dry or is it humid? It's eighty now. You know what I mean? Like this is like this feels good. October tenth <laughs> is eighty. Is it dry or is it is yeah, it? Yeah, it was eighty though? yesterday. Okay. Um, it's hu- very humid in the spring. In the summer, it does dry out a bit, um, but okay. it can still get humid in the summer, which pushes the heat index way up to like 115 Bro. or something like that. <laughs> I mean, thank um, you. God you got a pool, yeah. but I can't believe... I know that you guys love summer, but that's... I was assuming, oh, they must love summer because it's not that hot there. That's that's oh, very, it's very hot. hot. Wow. Yeah. Okay. You're I'm a better person A couple than of years me. ago, it... Where I lived in Death Valley, where the hottest place in the United <laughs> States on that day, like honestly, wow. it was pretty crazy. Okay, it was like 116 degrees. I was sitting here being like, "Well, I'm in Georgia, where it's really hot." No, that's that's <laughs> horrible. So, <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, Taylor, thank you so much for hanging out again, and thank you to all of y'all for listening to us. Um, if you have questions and things you want us to talk about, make sure to just tag us on Twitter at the Laravel Podcast or um, at Stauffer Matt and at Taylor Otwell. And um, I know that it's supposed to be called X, but I'm never changing. It's Twitter forever. Um, And until then, we'll see you all next time. All right. See you.